Welcome, welcome. It's so great to be with you in this third session that we are going to talk about some very interesting stuff. And uh, some of you haven't heard about these things in public, so I'm going to address issues tonight and help you to align yourself with God's purpose and get rid of guilt, sin, uh, wrong things in your life. So welcome. Uh, I'm looking forward to spend quality time with you here. And uh, as we're going to start, I want to pray and give you in a group some homework to do. So uh, let's pray. And uh, you, you must be in your group now, because in the group you're going to do some very important homework to do now. So uh, just before you move into groups, or so, let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come today to love you, to worship you, to honor you. We lift you up in this place with everyone that's listening. We come to worship and honor you as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We bring glory and praise to you, Father, because we really appreciate you. We love you. We adore you. We exalt you. We lift you up above everything. We exclaim that you are greatly exalted, beautiful, powerful. You, are, you have invaded this earth and you come through your church, through us, to come and change the, the world, the surface of this earth, be, through your kingdom that's manifesting through us. And Lord, we, we pray that your kingdom will come in our lives, that even in this session, that we will grow in your kingdom, understanding your purposes, your desires for our lives. We don't want to do anything, Father, that's not your perfect plan. So thank you for your Holy Spirit leading us, teaching us. And even as we touch on very sensitive topics in this session, I pray, Lord, that you help each one to hear it from your heart, to understand your perspectives and to know exactly what you want for our lives. Lord, thank you what you are teaching in these days. Thank you that you are healing in us and bring us to completeness in Christ. And I pray for each person here, everyone that's listening, Lord, that they will be able and be ready to be healed and restored in every area of their lives. And therefore, since that we start in this session, I speak healing over everyone. I speak openness over everyone. I speak into their lives the ability to hear the Holy Spirit. I open them and uh, uh, re re uh, deliver them even, Lord, from uh, deception and tradition and religion, things that's bounding them and bringing guilt and condemnation in their lives. I speak the freedom of the Holy Spirit over each one's life, that we can understand truth and the truth will set us free in it. We love you, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We receive the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Counsel us. Lead us in all truth. Just be in this place and touch every person. We love you. We welcome you. Let your kingdom come. Now, let your will be done. Now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to give you some group work immediately in your manual for those who have manuals. And for those who don't have manuals, visitors, um, you need to get a clean form just from us or get your own one. And uh, we just want to, to, to get everyone to participate in a group. Now, there's a form being called Life Graft uh, at this third session. And uh, it has two lines. Uh, the empty ones look like this. Now, I've got one that's already done. The empty one looks like this. So there's a line at the side and one at the bottom called your life graft. Now, part of your homework now in the group is that you're going to fill this in in terms of how you perceive your life up to now. Now, on the left side, I've got one that I've done just as an example. On the left side, it says, you know, uh, uh, average, good, very good, uh, he heavenly, and that is how you have experienced your life up to now. This is just your general life, how you, f you feel life was and how you enjoy life. On this bottom line, I want you to draw uh, your, your years of life. If you are 40 years, divide this bottom into 40. If you are 25, divide this in fives up to 25. So just stretch your years into the full 
area at the bottom and group leaders please help your people to do that if they don't understand then on on every year let's say on 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 year 10 when you were 10 years old how did you feel spiritually and emotionally um, about yourself and so you can go on every year maybe there's some specific things you can remember when you've met Jesus when you've been filled with the Holy Spirit when you have had a special experience of God when there was a backsliding experience when you went away from God and you went through a difficult time certain season or you come back to God and where the Holy Spirit really healed you and touch you and uh, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit will help you in this to draw a life graft of your own life to just see where you are now and obvious be be real in terms of that there's no sense in saying that you are having a heavenly experience while you are looking like hell itself so uh, please be be real and uh, if you're not sure, ask the people around you, how do I look like, you know. But uh, try to be real in terms of what you're experiencing and these things at the side. And uh, draw your own one. And uh, I give you about five minutes to draw one. And then in the group, another five minutes to ten minutes, we see how far you get to, to share it quickly with the rest of your group. So when everyone after five minutes has finished it, group leaders, uh, let everyone lift their page and quickly explain to the rest of the group why their graft looks like it looks. And, uh, and, and by that, uh, this is uh, actually giving something of themselves. We are revealing our hearts now to some people around you in terms of how do you experience your life at this stage. Now, this module, remember, is focused on the emotional healing thing, uh, the whole character restoration. So this is very much focused on how you've experienced life, how you've experienced your character, how you've experienced uh, things that happen around you, how do you feel about yourself, and how you went through certain seasons in your life. So go for it, please do it, and those who are watching the, the DVD, big screens, and TVs, and CDs, to switch it off until you finish, and then you can switch it on again. All right, welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed that. It's a good experience of sharing life, thinking about your own life, and things that God has done in your life. Now, uh, we're going to start with our next session tonight, session number three. Now, I want you to sit in such a way that you can see me, see the, uh, the screen, and uh, get relaxed. And uh, we're going to talk about real deep stuff, and uh, a little bit difficult stuff. Because uh, it's, it's continuation after last week where we've spoken about sexual health and management. How to manage your sexual life and you know how you're going to uh, manage it in the future that you can be sexually healthy. And for many of you who need healing in the sexual area of your life that you can, can work through this internally and prepare yourself for God's deep healing. And please don't ever think that this is a private thing. I'm not going to share it with anyone. This is so important part of your life. You need to be healed. Especially for those who are married. Don't continue with your marriage without being healing. Healed. You know, you need healing. Your marriage must be the best one upon this earth. We are mobilizing you as kingdom people. And as kingdom people, you need to manage your sexuality the way God wants you. So if you are married, you need to have the best sexual relationship upon this planet. If you are not married, then you have to manage it the best way God and the Holy Spirit is helping you to do it. But you better understand what it's all about. Because this is stuff that your mother and father did not teach you. And even the world that we are living in that supposedly teach us this, uh, they are lying to us. They give us a lot of lies and wrong perspectives. The stuff you see on TV and the stuff you hear from other people and your friends and the things that you've heard in school and other ways, m most of that is lies and it's not the perspective of God. And God wants to teach you basic things to understand your sexuality, who you are, and also to get you to understand how to operate sexually and glorify God and uh, that God does not need to feel uh, shame about you but that he is proud about your behavior and how you deal with your own sexuality. Now last week we've 
touch on a lot of topics. We went deep into the whole purpose of God, why God has made us as sexual beings, and that uh, I hope after last week you've discovered that you are a sexual being, whether you like it or not, but you better like it and that you get healing if you don't accept that, because many of us and many of you don't accept your sexuality, and therefore you are actually resisting what God has placed inside of you. Now you have to deal with that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you need to deal with that and you have to make sure that any negative feelings in your life, anything that's in you that is demonic, anything that's pain, emotional pain, that God has dealt with that and that you are free from that. We last week also focused on the purpose of sex. Why did God give something like sex? I mean, can't we, you know, won't it be better if God did not give something like that? I mean, many, many problems will be less. But God decided that this is the best for human beings. God decided that you need it, I need it, we need it. As human beings, God has created something very special, very unique. And you better be an expert understanding what God is saying to you. And you become an expert in dealing and managing your own sexuality. And uh, you need to glorify God. That's what he says about your body. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Glorify God with your temple, with your body. And uh, therefore, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And whatever we do as we worship, as we love people, as we live out in our relationships in marriage, we better worship God, bring honor to him, and bring holiness to him. And um, contrary to what many people think, uh, the world think, they think God is against sex. And the worldly people out there think that God doesn't want the church and his people to enjoy sex. And obviously they are stupid, they are misled, and uh, they don't understand the Bible and what Bible principles have said. Now last week I've touched on many scriptures. You know what Paul said about marriage, that each man and each woman should have their own husband and wife so that the devil won't get the handle in your life. Uh, we've read Proverbs five that says that that uh, verse 18 that every man every woman must enjoy the body of each other and that that we must satisfy each other physically this is great commandments and and uh, as we study the whole book of of uh, song of S uh, solomon <clears throat> we see the greatness of the physical attraction and physical relationship god is and god wants us to enjoy physical relationship and it's what he has given. It's a gift that God has given to me and you. And you have to receive this gift and deal with it very sensitively. Use it to bring glory and honor to God. We were talking last week about the power of sexual drive. We will touch on something again today uh, because it's dangerous if you don't manage that. Uh, and then we, we spoke a lot about how to manage your sexual drive. And I hope that it helped you last week to, to realize that you have a responsibility. You can't just be like an animal. You can't just do things the way the world is doing it. You need to manage it far better than people around you. You have to manage it and get your focus right to bring glory and honor to God. Now we are now doing session number three. That is, uh, the topic is sexual obsessions, sexual obsessions. And I want to talk in this session a little bit about obsessions that people develop. And it's always difficult, you know, uh, people, some people are sexually uh, frigid, cold, and they actually have the same problems well, as those who have sexual obsessions because your frigidity, your inability to function sexually is also a dysfunction. It's also a sickness. <clears throat> it's also something you need healing from. So there's actually more people on this planet who are sexual dysfunction by being cold or frigid or, or withdrawing from sex than those who have lust and is doing and overdoing everything in the other way. Now, sex and the function of sex in one's life is, is again like a pendulum, you know. Some people are on one side of the pendulum, some on the other side of the pendulum. The one side of the pe pendulum are those who overdo it, who are focusing, who are worshiping sex. Then it's the other side of the pendulum, those who ignore sex, those who hope it will disappear, those who don't want to hear it, don't want to think about it, and, I mean, they feel guilty, they feel, uh, you know, my body doesn't want that, but 
like I've said already many times, if your body is re resisting the sexual experience, it's because of pain. And it's pain in your emotions that you haven't dealt with. Now, the only reason when the, the desire for sex disappear is when you have the gift of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, where he says, I've received the gift of singleness. And that means that the ability or the desire to enjoy sex is being taken away. And now your relationship with God and spending time with Him, your worshiping of God actually become better for you than those who are participating in sexual acts. And uh, that's a miracle. If God gives you that ability to enjoy God and worship Him and He's your husband and uh, He's the one that you are serving fully. And uh, like Paul said that He has a gift of, of um being withdrawing or not involved in a relationship, um, that's a real gift. And uh, some of you need that gift. Maybe we must pray that gift over your life so that it can manifest. And some of you say, no, 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 thank you. I don't want that gift. You can keep that one. And, uh, but if you, you need that, you want to follow that, you want to serve God as a single person, I mean, why not ask God to give you the gift of celibacy? A gift of staying focused on God and not focusing on these physical body things, sexual things that you are totally uh, functioning without it. And uh, for some people like Jesus and Paul, it was a great blessing to operate that way. So there's nothing wrong with people who are like that. Uh, if Jesus could function well like that and Paul could and many other people, I mean, why not you? And uh, for the others who don't have that gift, we need to teach you principles. And even Paul, with this gift, actually spent a lot of chapters in the Bible teaching people about sex. And obvious, it was not out of experience, but out of the revelation of the Holy Spirit, what God is saying about husband and wife. And he said, it's better that each one has its own husband and own wife because of the, the things that's happening in this world and uh, so that the enemy can't get a hold and a handle on you. So you need to, to develop this great relationship with your partner and marriage and enjoy sex together. Now, when we talk about obsessions, uh, obsessions means that when sex becomes uh, a goal in itself, where sex becomes the vision of your life, where like Freud, the father of psychology, he in the beginning said that, that every person is created around sex, that his whole brain and system is all about just sex, and everything we do is about sexual activity. Now, that's not true, and that comes from someone who had the sexual problem. And actually, later in his life, when he became an old man, he changed his philosophy from that, uh, maybe because he was sexually inactive at that stage. But, you know, sex is not the center of your life. Although you are a sexual being, like we've said last week, you are not created to, to worship sex or to allow sex to be the center of your life. Sex must always be after the priorities of God. It's like food. It's many people and even some of you here are worshiping food. Food is more important for you than going to church or worshiping or fellowshipping and spending time with people or praying. And, and, and I mean, you won't miss a meal, but you will miss church. You won't miss a meal, but you will not go and minister to someone. You will not miss your breakfast, but you will not pray in the mornings. I mean, that means that you are worshiping your food. Your food is more important than your communication of God and relationship with Him. So that, that is the danger. And now the same applies to sex, the role that sex is playing in our lives. And you have to ask yourself, is sex taking the place of God or my, the role of investment in my family, the time that I need to play with my children? And so on and so on. No, uh, many people in world in the world is has obsessions about sex, and they are living for this. Uh, it, it becomes a way of escape from their own personal pain and things that they are in, involved in. And and I I know that many of you sit here is using sex just to cover pain. You don't use it correctly as God wants you to use it. And it's so important. You need to be healed. So that sex is not a crutch in your life, but sex is there to glorify God with the partner God has given you. And therefore, get healed. Allow God to show you all your sexual pain and things that happen to you. 
Um, just a while ago, I ministered to a, a leader of a church, and this person, as a pastor in the church, fell into sexual sin with many people in his church. And so I, I, I prayed and helped him through this, you know, because he, he, he confessed to many people in his life that he has a problem with sex, and everyone just sort of said, all right, you're forgiven, go and don't sin anymore. But no one helped him to get to the root of his problem. Because the root of the problem is, is not the fact that he has, he's over-sexually active. The problem is that he was molested as a child. And no one ever who, who worked with him, and even the pastors who actually fired him out of the church environment, no one cared about this guy's root problem to heal him and to restore him. And that's typical how the, the traditional church world are operating out there. Even those who call themselves Pentecostal and charismatic churches, most of them are the same. They, they don't care about healing or restoring people. If you are not performing onto a certain level they expect, then they kick you out. And meantime, God wants to heal, restore, and rebuild you and make you a dynamic, whole, and complete person. So after hearing the story of this pastor, I asked him, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show us the root of your problem. Because his, his life, all his life, he was involved in wrong sexual relationships. He betrayed his wife so many times. He had affairs so many times. And deep in his heart, he wants to love his wife more than anyone. He, deep in his heart, he never wanted to betray her. Never, he never wanted to have anyone else. But something inside of him was driving him every time into a situation where he ended up into a sexual relationship, a once-off and a few that went on to a relationship. And every time he said, why am I doing this? I don't like this. I hate this. I don't want to be in this. I want to be pure. I want to be dedicated to my wife. I want to live for her. But I don't know. Something is taking me into this every time. And as I was praying with him, you know, the Holy Spirit is so faithful. He just quickly showed us the root. And he took us to when he was five years old, when someone who was working in their garden, uh, molested him and actually placed a spirit upon his life of lust. And as a little five-year-old boy, he suddenly became so focused on his sexuality. And he started to masturbate at the age of five. And sex became the main activity in his life. And he was masturbating every day of his life. And as he grew up as a teenager, he got involved in sexual relationships. And I mean, he messed up his life even long time before he got married. His wife never knew about his sexual background. And then he became a pastor. And he was struggling with this thing inside of him because he didn't know what to do. He hoped God forgave him, but he was fighting with his emotions and his sexuality because continuously they, he was aware of people with their sexuality. You know, and when people have a spirit of lust on them, you can actually see them. And those who have a, a sexual problem, pick that up quickly. You can come into the audience, you pick up the eyes of those who have lustful eyes. You pick that up in the audience with people. That's a spirit upon them. And those who have a spirit of lust, they draw each other and they just come to each other. And to, I mean, and without knowing, they will just end up in bed. That's the spirit of lust. And, and God delivered this guy as I prayed for him and healing came into his life. And as I prayed for him, uh, sexual demons came out and a lot of stuff came out of his life. And he was a pastor. And I remember, uh, I will teach you later, that a lot of problems people have are demonic and it's emotional pain. So it was so great to see how God was healing this, this man. Now, another story I want to tell you here before we go into the technical detail. Uh, a very sad story of a young man who came to see me some years ago. And uh, this guy was, when he came to see me, he was in standard 10, matric. And as a matric pu pupil, he... He was already involved for more than five years in a homosexual relationship. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about homosexuals and how God wants to heal them and how God does not make homosexuals and, and why they become homosexuals. Either lesbians, homosexuals, God wants to heal them. So next week, we're going to focus on that and teach you how to understand the homosexuals and why they became like that and how God wants to, to heal them or restore them and make them beautiful, normal people. And uh, 
And there's many of us, even among you sitting here, you need area healing on that area. It's not just breaking a habit or a relationship. It's breaking with the spirit and pain inside of you that God wants to heal you. You need healing. Now, this young man of about 17, 18 came to see me, and he was so desperate. He said he's fed up. He's just tired of being involved in this homosexual relationship. He wants to come out, but he does not know how. He's being hooked up in this thing, and uh, the guy that, that is, he has a relationship with is, is about five or eight years older than him, and he wants to get out of this thing. And then he told me the sad story. He said he was in standard six. We call it nowadays, what, grade eight. He went with his church camp. Listen to this one. He went with the church camp as a young standard six person, uh, on the camp, and uh, on this church camp, one of the, tut- uh, the Sunday school teachers, or we call it nowadays church, uh, children's church teachers, one of these men was sleeping with him in the room where they were sleeping, and this teacher approached him in the first night that they've been there and started to touch him, and and this guy didn't know what to do. He's a young little boy, and here's someone he honored, someone who's a teacher. And this guy touched him, and this guy told him, I love you, and you are special, and he gave him love. And by the way, this, this young man did not have a father. And you see, the homosexuals normally go for those who are uh, um, open and... Um, sensitive for these approaches, those who don't have father relationships and who are coming out of broken homes. They are the people who easily fell into this, these relationships. So this guy started to, to, to develop a sexual relationship. He sodomized him. Um, and this, this young guy at first didn't know what happened. And this guy said, man, it's okay. I mean, it's just between me and you, and they started, and this guy eventually developed, you know, the relationship grew, and this young guy became dependent on this guy because he was paying him with monies and things and buying him sweets like they all do in terms of that pedophiles, they are doing it with little children, and pedophiles will buy, it's like old men buy sweets and things for the little children, and they always pay them with little things, so keep quiet, it's our secret, don't share it with anyone, so this sick thing just continued, and actually in this young man's life, it continued for five years, as this Sunday school or church leader kept on having this relationship with this young man. After these years, this young man actually thought and he believed that he is a homosexual. I mean, this would never happen if he was not a homosexual. And he thought, all right, God made me like that because that's the story that homosexuals tell everyone. God made us like this, so we must accept ourselves and enjoy what we have. So he thought that is the way. But deep inside, every homosexual feel guilt. They feel condemnation. They feel something is wrong. They, they feel this, this type of love that we so supposedly have for one another. Something is wrong. It's false. It's not true love. It's not God's love. It's just a, a perception of love that's been created by the enemy himself. And now as this young man came to me, I ministered to him and, and delivered him and break that soul tie, that sexual tie that this guy, it's actually a spirit of control and homosexuality. And I broke, broke that control over this young man. I loosened him from that. And God really did a great thing for him and uh, prayed over him and restored him. And A while later, because I wanted to see him often, when he came back to see me again, uh, he was telling me how good he feels and how he feels that that this is out of his life. He hasn't got any desire for this. He really believed God healed him. He's now a a man. He feels like a man, and he's looking forward to his, his own wife one day and be healthy. And then he asked me just one very practical question that we are touching on in this session. And that is about masturbation. He said, uh, no, I feel guilty because I can't stop masturbate. I'm still masturbating every day or, you know, playing with myself and satisfying myself every day. You know, and he felt very guilty about this. 
And uh, now the question, and this is why I'm telling this story before we start with the detail here. The question is, what, what would you tell a person in that position about themselves? What would you tell them how to deal with their lives? Uh, what will you tell them? Now, the typical churchy, religious person out there will say, man, just confess it and stop doing it. And uh, if, you, if that was true, uh, people would be easily delivered from that. Now, it's not so easy and it's not so simple as just tell people you may not do it, so stop doing it. And now I just decide I'm not going to do it, I'm stopping it. And uh, that's not what I tell this guy, but I will try to give you the answer through the session as we continue about the whole principle of masturbation and how people are being addicted to it, trapped in it, or how do you experience this in your life? Because all masturbation is not naked, ne necessary wrong, it's all not necessary addictive, and uh, therefore we need to see the full picture as we talk about this. And how people, some of you who sit here, needs to get rid of guilt feelings, and feelings of condemnation as the enemy steals your joy, steals your power, steals your relationship with God about this thing. Now, like I've said last week, and you need to understand that before you listen to this, and is that God created sex to be glorified. And he created sex that you can enjoy it. He created sex that you can be healthy. He created sex that two people can be interdependent and enjoy each other and fulfill each other. Now that's the purpose that we need to keep in mind as we venture into this. So masturbation, that ugly word, I don't like the word, but that's about all we have, is self-fulfillment. When people focus on themselves or do some practical um, playing with themselves sexually, either man or woman. Now statistics, and statistics are statistics, they're not always very accurate, but it gives us some idea of what's happening in this world. And uh, so statistics of people who invested in sexuality and sexual behavior, they are telling us that the majority of men Actually, 9 out of 10 men, that's what I experienced. 9 out of 10 men would masturbate regularly. And the one that says he does not do it might be a liar. And uh, obviously there's people who are not in this or they are sexually frigid or dysfunctional. But the world out there, we need to talk about the reality of this. So who, who's doing this thing? Playing with themselves. When we talk about men, and ladies, you better understand this, men is not like you, because men's sexuality is an outward, like their, their sexual, um, uh, uh, biological um, uh, tools they have, God has placed it in the outside. So they're far more sensitive and aware when they have an erection. They're far more aware of that. Actually, an uh, average man has up to six erections per night when he's sleeping. So uh, that can be quite challenging for men and for the ladies. Um, and some ladies need to understand how a man is functioning. Because ladies, you don't feel a erection. You don't know what it is when a man is having an erection and he cannot control it uh, necessary every time. And uh, therefore, he needs to, to know how to deal with this and how to function with it. If you raise little boys, I mean, you would know for those who are mothers and households, I mean, the little boys growing up and as they grow up, they have erections in the morning, you know, and that's uh, uh, for other reasons. And, you know, it's part of life. You need to understand that it's there. Now, ladies does not understand it necessary because they never have that feeling. And ladies seldom have a feeling of urging for sex or fulfillment. They don't have it like men. Uh, the the clear closest that ladies can come to that is when a lady is being stimulated sexually in a, a, a preparation of a sexual experience. And when she gets ready or feeling um, that uh, the touch on her body is actually uh, uh, creating a rose, arouse her in terms of what is happening, that's the same feeling men might have 10 times a day. And, uh, and they have to deal with that. And ladies only deal with that now and then when they are actually touched and prepared in, in, in this whole sexual relationship. 
Now, with ladies, in terms of, of masturbation, they say between 60 and 65% of women uh, masturbate at some time in their lives. Um, many went through seasons where they did that and stop it and start again. And the seasons are many times uh, linked to emotional down seasons or times where they've discovered themselves or times where they were lonely and so on. So statistically with women, it's far less than with men. Now, what does masturbation's effect on a person? Because that's the question we have here. And when I talk about this, the reality is that um, it differs how we approach this. When we talk with church people and those, many of you come out of different churches, uh, I realize that churches are talking differently about this. Your pastor or previous pastor or things you've heard, you know, they are totally, they say, you know, masturbation is sin. And some people say, if you do that, your hands will fall off. You will grow hair on your hands. Um, and a lot of funny things are being said about, I mean, there's parents that tell their little boys, if you touch there, your hands will fall off. And uh, things like that. Uh, people will even go so far to say, if you touch yourself, that will be sin against the Holy Spirit. Because they say your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you touch yourself, I mean, you are sinning against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the greatest lie that you've ever heard in history. It's like eating nice food and telling you are sinning against the Holy Spirit. So we need to help people to understand, and even our young people and children to understand what's the role of it. So what's the effect of masturbation in a person's life? And I, I'm looking to the medical, the emotional, and to the spiritual. Let's quickly do that. Medical or biological, what is the effect in your body? There's no negative effect. Otherwise, God won't give it to you. Sexuality has got no negative effect on your body. It will not change anything. It will not become dysfunctional. It will not take away your ability to be, have normal sex. Uh, actually, it's like uh, any, if you run, you get fit to run, and you get fitter to run better. So when you, you touch yourself or masturbation actually might be part of getting fitter sexually or preparing yourself for sexual activity. So medically, it, it alleviates or release uh, pressure. Now I'm going to explain the pressure just now. And uh, there's a release of endorphins, endorphins in your brain. Your endorphins is being released whenever you laugh or enjoy sex. There's endorphins being released in your brain. And that, the cause of that is it heals your body. It let, let your body relax. And it gives you a good feeling. That's why people do things to release endorphins. And there's many things to do that. People who are jog jogging, who are running or doing things, you go through that pain uh, Drempel, they call it. You go through that pain uh, a line. If you go beyond it, it activates actually endorphins with the adrenaline in your body, and it gives you a, over, uh, a feeling of well-being. It boosts your system, the adrenaline, but people get addicted to adrenaline, and they get addicted to endorphins. Now, whether you run to get it or whether you eat until endorphins is being released because when you take a chocolate the same endorphins is being released and give you the same feeling as that sex gives you and that's why you use that to feel better and uh, so biologically in your body there's a release of endorphins that can help you to be healed and to relax and sleep better and I mean it has a, a lot of biological positive effect on your skin on your body on your digestive system in, in overall then emotionally People who are uh, caught up in masturbation usually uh, feel very guilty emotionally. They, they walk around and feeling, I've made a big sin, um, I've done something wrong, um, God is going to kill me, uh, I'm weak, or there's something wrong with me in terms of what I'm doing. You know, everyone else is better than me and I'm weak and I've got this problem. So people tend to feel that emotionally. Spiritually, because of this, uh, especially because of the thought patterns 
With most masturbation, there's going fantasies with that. And in the fantasies, people are thinking or desiring things that's illegal. They are thinking about things they may not think. They are involved their minds in situations or desires with people they are not supposed to be in. And that's where sin comes in actually. And so then masturbation becomes sin and sinfulness when I involved my mind in relationships and thinking of things that's illegal. And that's where most people make the mistake. And that's where we actually in this session needs to help people and our young people when we teach them about these things is to protect your mind. You cannot allow mental pictures and fantasies to, to go beyond what God allows you. Even in marriage or before marriage, the warfare is in here. It's not actually in your body. It's all in here. So in that session, this, this part, paragraph, I say medically, biologically, physiologically, um, to, to masturbate has got no negative effects. Actually, it has the opposite. It has a lot of positive effect in your body. Emotionally, uh, for those who have wrongly trained, those who don't understand their sexuality, those who don't know what's happening with their bodies, they tend to go on a guilt trip and live in guilt, and actually that guilt <clears throat> take over their whole life and, and bound them up. And spiritually, uh, many people overstep in terms of it feels like this thing becomes this in, between me and God and draws me away from God. And uh, now the next paragraph, biblical principles. What is biblical principles concerning that? What does the Bible say about this thing that we satisfy ourselves? Does the Bible say anything about it? And then, unfortunately, and we need to say, or fortunately for some, the Bible does not say a thing. There's not one scripture, nothing about this whole activation or whole activity of masturbation. Now, the logical thing is, if the Bible does not say one thing about this, how can we preach sermons against it? You know, like I know many pastors, I know people who think that if people would do this, they are really dysfunctional. And they put so much guilt to continuously on the people because they pretend and tell young people, you know, if you touch yourself, you are really stupid, you will demonize, you know, the enemy has a hold of your life. So children are going from day to day and every second day they are making the mistake and they feel they're full of sin. So Sunday they must come and confess sin again. And they never grow because they are continuously under sin. And that's unfortunately what many pastors are doing is just place a lot of condemnation on people. Actually, with people like that, you don't need the devil itself. So as the Bible is not teaching us anything about it, does not say no, does not say yes, does not say anything, we need to take principles in the Bible and say, all right, in general, what does the Bible say about sex and sexual behavior? Why did God give us sex? And we've already touched on it last week. So uh, in terms of summarizing it, we must say masturbation can violate some biblical principles. And, and obvious it's about when this becomes your worship, when, uh, when the purpose of sex is to fulfill someone else, primary, number one. The purpose of sex uh, is to, to be given for you to enjoy it with someone else that God has given to you as your spouse. And it's not, number one, given to you to enjoy for yourself. So if that is the principle, then we need to, to, to think about it. Now, I can't say that God didn't give you your sexuality not for enjoying it yourself because I don't have scripture for that. I can't also not say your sexual feelings is just for your spouse because I, I think God wants to combine this as he prepare you to have the best sexual relationship with your spouse. He is combining that because you need to understand how your body functions sexually. So somewhere you need to learn, somewhere you need to discover yourself, somewhere you need to understand how your body function. Sex is there to demonstrate unity and to keep you dependent of a spouse. So when sexual things, the sexual drive becomes a, a, a thing just for myself, uh, then it, it, it goes beyond what God has created it as a normal phenomenon. Uh, God wants you to understand, and, and, and what I'm trying to say here, what is the biblical principle? If anything controls you, it becomes sin. And that's the bottom line. If anyone, 
And everything I say about masturbation applies to food. If anyone say masturbation is sin, then you must say food is also sin because it's enjoyable. You, you feed yourself. You don't sit there and someone else feed you. I mean, normally as adults. So you feed yourself, but you enjoy your food far more when you share it with someone you love. You have a meal with someone. Sex is being mostly enjoyed with the one God has given to you. But if you are eating alone, then it becomes very lonely. And if food becomes your, op- your, your obsession, like sex, then there's something wrong. And then you need healing and you need deliverance. So let's take a break, uh, a water break, and let's relax, walk around, and I call you back in a few minutes. <laughs>